Aloha. Welcome to another episode of the Hawaii State Bar Association's Living Legend Lawyers. This is brought to you in part by Think Tech Hawaii. And this is part of the brainchild of our current HSBA president, Greg Markham, who initiated what we call the 3D project. That is a three digit project. Doesn't mean that they just have three digit. What it means is that they only have three digits in their bar numbers. These are our senior attorneys who have been uh, licensed or practiced probably in the 1960s, 1970s, and um, you know, are really legends of the profession. Today's program is centered on, on the Maui law practice, and that is what our three guests that we have here today have in common. They all practice law or been practicing law on Maui. I'd like to introduce our guests. First of all, let me introduce myself. My name is Craig Wagnold. I'm the 2013 president of the Hawaii State Bar. I'm a partner at the law firm of Bayes, Long, and Rose, Homa, and I have the distinction and the honor of serving as a host. So let me start at the far end over here. We have John McConnell, retired Judge John McConnell. Now, John came over in 1967, was licensed to practice law here in 1969. He in 1984, uh, was uh, was put on the, the bench and has been on the circuit court bench, served there for, uh, I believe, 13 years, uh, including serving as administrative and senior uh, family court judge. Uh, he has been chairman of the Hawaii Labor and Industrial Relations Appeals Board. He was deputy director of the Hawaii State Department of Commerce and Consumer Affairs. He was deputy attorney general, and he was a private practitioner. He's pretty much done it all. So. Great to have you here, John. <laughs> I'll move. There are a few I'll, things I haven't done. <laughs> well, we're going to get uh, get next to uh, to Phil Lowenthal. Phil is a graduate of uh, UC Berkeley in 1969. He got licensed to practice here in 1970. Initially, for almost 10 years, he was uh, the supervising deputy director for the state of Hawaii in Maui County uh, for uh, the public defender's office in Maui County. Uh, I was supervising myself because I didn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want anybody else. Okay, well, and he, he also the, the, he then uh, went on in 1981 to form Lowenthal in August, which he continued at for somewhere in the neighborhood of 21 years or so, yes, and, and then uh, moved on to his current law office of Philip uh, H. Lowenthal, where he continues to practice. We're very glad to have you here as well. Thank you. Thank you. And finally, just to uh, my immediate left, is uh, Jim Kruger. Uh, Jim Kruger is a, a graduate of the Loyola University School of Law and came over here in 1966. It was explaining to me that at the time you actually had to wait a year before you could even take the bar exam. So he was licensed uh, just after that. He's also admitted to practice uh, in Colorado. And the interesting thing is I, I think you could look up just about any list of the influential attorneys uh, that have, have made their mark the law in the state of Hawaii, and uh, Jim Kruger would be pretty much at the top of any of those, as with these other gentlemen, and we're, we're, we're very thankful to have each of you here. Thank you. Jim, now you've been referred to by some as uh, the smoke through the keyhole, I think, uh, as a cat that has nine lives. I'm curious how you got your start here in Hawaii. What, what brought you here and, and, and how things uh, developed from there to develop a career practicing law on now? A sailboat. I grew up in Southern California, involved in aquatics in the ocean, et cetera. I used to race sailboats across the ocean and things like that. I wound up crewing for a guy named John Barcourt, who owned the Colony Surf. When I left um, the firm that I was clerking for, he asked me what I was going to do. He said uh, I should talk to his lawyer. His lawyer was Frank Paget. Bottom line was I went to work for Padge and stayed with him for a good number of years before I moved to Maui. Okay. A similar story, no boat involved with my partner, Bernie Bay. So, <laughs> Well, Bernie was a member of the firm that I was with Paget. He was about the third or fourth lawyer that came in after that. Is that right? Phil, well, how about yourself? What? Tell me a little bit about what brought you here and, and, and the start of your career, particularly as, as it, what took you to Maui. Uh, in 1967, after my first year of law school in Berkeley, I I came to Maui, I just picked it out of an atlas, and spent the summer on Maui and, and was dazzled and decided to come back after I finished 
uh, school, so I went and finished my final two years of law school, and the day after the California bar exam, September 1, 1969, I moved to Maui with, uh, I think I had saved $500, so uh, I'm still there. Sort of a leap of faith. I was lucky. I was very fortunate. And, and, I, and then I saw in the Maui News, after I'd been working in a sawmill, that there was an opening for a first public defender for Maui County. And I put my name in, and I was fortunate to get that job. That was in 1970, and it was contingent on passing the bar. Which you did, first try. That's what they say. I don't know, <laughs> don't know how that happened, but it did. Fantastic. John, similar story, what brought you here? Uh, the Army sent me here. Okay. And, um, in 67, I stayed for a couple of years, but I had no intent of staying in the Army. Okay. And uh, didn't really know where I was going to go, so a good friend of mine was got a job as the political reporter for the advertiser. He seemed to like it, so I, I went down and I got a job with Padgett. Their hiring standards may have been a little, <laughs> a little shaky. <laughs> That's not what I heard. Yeah, we, <laughs> made, we, we made an exception. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, I wasn't there very uh, near as long as Jim, but there was a, there was a lot of us, you know. Uh, ben Caetano, Wilfred Judge Watanabe. Uh, oh, this was Walter on Oahu, Arcata. or this was over on This was on Oahu. Oahu. I, I was on Oahu until 1984. Okay. And went over to Maui as a carpet-bagging judge. I see. Which has never happened today, I don't think. Was that part of the goal? Let me start in that. Did you want to go in and become a judge, or how did that happen? Well, I, yes, and I, I mean, I had been chairman of the Labor Appeals Board for, for four years. I didn't want to do workers' comp for the rest of my life, mm -hmm. and yeah, I wanted to be a judge. Uh, I've been judging for 35 years. I haven't really practiced law <laughs> for all that time. Sure, and you're continuing to do that now. Right? Yes, I, oh, right, sense. right. I retired in 1998, and since then I've been uh, arbitrating and, and mediating uh, cases, right. although I'm slowing down a little bit. Primarily on Maui, or? or um, I come here quite often as well. Okay. Phil, how about you? So you came here, you decided, you, know, you worked for the, uh, as this, uh, uh, you mentioned, deputy public defender. And after that? Supervising. Oh, I'm sorry, supervising. <laughs> <laughs> okay, no, that's I removed different. that because you I'm told that, me I'm there just was teasing. no one to supervise. I know, but I supervised myself. Yes. So you did that. You did that. That was, that was about nine years, and then you moved off to start your own practice. But uh, I'd like to talk for a moment about those nine years. Because ah. that was 1970 and 1979 in Maui. I was the first real criminal defense lawyer for Maui County. and. Um, it, as that, it struck me I had to set the highest standards I could, yeah. uh, and law enforcement had to cope with a criminal defense lawyer for the first time, and uh, the, the scene was not as congested as it is today, and there were not as many people on Maui, Molokai, and I, and we would fly around to the different uh, uh, jurisdictions every month we'd go to all the court, the prosecutor, and the judge, and myself, we'd fly to Lanai, we'd fly to Molokai, and have our court there. And uh, it was a, quite an experience, because I was on call 24-7 for being the only criminal defense lawyer. Uh, you got every call, from multiple homicides to wow. driving left of center. And uh, it was a, it was a, Quite a learning experience and a great experience for me and and the whole community, for that matter. Fortunately, uh, Judge Fukuoka was uh, committed to the rule of law, and we made that transition from sort of a plantation oligarchy uh, scene to a that really uh, kind of brought a, a piece of statehood to Maui County as the uh, rule of law was applied. I was going to ask how difficult was that for you in just in the community. It was great. It, was, it wasn't difficult. Uh, 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 sometimes the police would uh, 
uh, have a hard time accepting the fact that they might need to get a warrant. But, uh, uh, you know, I represented low-income people, which was most people. Yeah. And uh, the, the uh, judiciary was very open to uh, the rule of law and legal motions. And, and I'd say the bar was uh, very open to uh, uh, raising the standards, which I tried to do. Fantastic. Jim, how about you? Well, we had sort of a similar situation, only on the civil side, not the criminal. There's a little history there with uh, Frank Padgett. Frank had been a senior partner at Robinson Castle and Anthony. And uh, he'd always wanted to do plaintiff's work, but was their primary business litigator, condemnation litigator. And so when he and Hod Greeley decided to leave there and they set up their own firm, I joined them three months later. In a very short period of time, because Frank had had an aloha for Maui, we began to proselyte Maui. And he sent me up every Friday. And so I would see people up there. And over a year or two, we got to be that we would see people on Thursday and Friday. We took our office and put a head in, a bed in it, and I stayed over Thursday nights, and we began to get a practice. What was interesting, I, without knowing it, wanted to be a plaintiff's lawyer. I was reluctant to even do debate in law school, but I got the highest score in the torts exam, and they used it for a model answer, so maybe I did have an affinity for it without knowing it. But like Phil, when I came to Maui, there were nine lawyers there. And everybody was in bed with either the state, the county, mm -hmm. the plantation, or the insurance industry. All right. Nobody represented people. Wait a minute. What do you mean, wait a minute? I was there. Well, no, you were doing criminal stuff. Uh, in the civil section, if someone was injured and had a tort claim right. to make, there was no one would represent them. So we began to do it. I think we were the first people that began to do it. And the people on Maui are, are wonderful. Uh, if you do a good job for them, that word goes and spreads like a virus. Uh, the same thing is true if you don't do well. And I was a pretty competitive person. I did a lot of sports, and we just didn't like to lose. And so we developed a relationship with a lot of people, and uh, we've been there ever since. That's great. That's great. Is that Each of you has mentioned sort of the, the, the nature of, particularly early on in your practice, the small legal environment that you came into over there. Was that difficult or was that exciting? Was that a new frontier or was that something that you looked at and said, wow, I don't know if this will work? For me, that was great. It was very rewarding and pleasant. And uh, we'd, like Phil said, we'd fly to Molokai or Hana, the yeah. whole court. Um, the lawyers were, have, we'd have lunch with the lawyers. <coughs> it was, uh, it was just a very pleasant and, and interesting uh, experience for me. I, I, you know, I, yeah. I've been listening to doctors as a, at the appeals board for years, and sure. this was a refreshing change. Okay. Do, particularly in the criminal area and such, did you find that, that uh, having you know, being the first in there came along with challenges, or for the most part, it, it, it came easy? Well, for me personally, uh, stepping into the courtroom in front of Judge Fukuoka was very scary uh, because I didn't really have any backup on Maui. If I had a real question, I could call Brooke Hart or John Evans over here. But on Maui, it was like, oh my goodness, I'm here in front of the scary judge. Uh, but it was a little different then. Uh, I must say that this was a time before uh, people in custody had to wear those special orange or other outfits. Uh, people weren't, uh, didn't have to come to court wearing leg irons mm -hmm. or uh, handcuffs and weren't uh, treated uh, as if they were about to pounce on you. And uh, that environment uh, slowly changed, and I think for the worse over the years, it sort of had a certain brutalizing effect on all of the uh, participants. But in those days, um, bail, there were no bondsmen in Maui County. Bail was set in the amount people could 
before generally. Uh, and it was, uh, in, in many respects, more benign to the participants than it is today. So although it was uh, many hours in the law library at night, uh, overall, I'd say the system was uh, more compassionate and more uh, personal. When we come back, I'm going to want to hear some stories. So we're going we're gonna to break for commercial for a minute. You're watching uh, Living Legend Lawyers brought to, you by, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association and Think Tank Hawaii. We'll be right back. Hi, James. Hi, Hi Keith. <laughs> My name is Keith Bettinger. I knew that. And I'm the host of Think Tech Asia. I knew that too. Here on Think Tech. Fabulous. Uh, You've got a great show going, thank Keith. Thank you very much. And for uh, our viewers out there that are interested in Think Tech Asia, it airs every Tuesday from 4 to 4.45. And uh, it can be accessed online at thinktech.com. Yeah, so what kind of guests do you like? Well, we have a, a number of guests from, from academia, uh, from uh, pr practitioners of international affairs. Sometimes we have uh, military officials. Sometimes we have public officials on the show. And our goal, uh, we try to talk about uh, current issues in South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, and Central Asia, all throughout the Asian realm in more depth than you would find in traditional mainstream That's media. the difference, isn't it? Exactly. That you're, you're reaching out beyond what ordinary news media would do. Right. We're and trying that's to, why we like you so much. We're trying to provide a, a thinking person's perspective, an intelligent perspective on what's going on and where both sides of the story, or even when there's more than two sides, we try to cover every angle. And I think that that's, uh, that's uh, one of the big benefits that we provide here at ThinkTech is it's a really innovative source of educational programming for the people of Hawaii. You're great, Keith. You're, you are a great host. You've got a great show going on. I watch it every week. Thanks very much. Why don't James. you guys watch it every week too, okay? 4.45 to uh, 4 to 4.45 every Tuesday. <laughs> and welcome back. I'm Craig Wagnall. I'm the host of today's show and Living War Legend Lawyers. I'm having a tough time saying that one. These are our 3D, our three-digit attorneys. And I have with us today Jim Kruger, Phil Lowenthal, and John McConnell. We're brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association. And we've been talking a little bit about the practice of law in Maui. And I had a question. I found this transcript of proceedings. And it mentions Jim Kruger. And, and, and so I have, to, I, I have to read it to you. It says, and this is, this is a Mr. David. I don't know exactly who this attorney is. But he said, you know, Your Honor, I have to admit I've seen some talented people in my life. But Jim Kruger is a talented person. We, he can tell you more ways then two, the two plus two isn't four than anybody I've seen in my life. He has more lives than a cat. He's like smoke through a keyhole. I don't even know what that means. You know, I could go on and on. I'm absolutely in awe of the webs and stories and, and the confusion that Mr. Kruger can weave. It's incredible to me. And I have to say that I honestly think I can go to my grave someday knowing that I've seen the greatest at something. Well, now that's quite a compliment, actually, in the transcript. Well, What's the story behind that? Well, the guy who spoke was the representative of a Jones Day law firm, for the people who don't know who they are. They were about an 1,100-person law firm in five different cities. This case that you're reading from involved the old Firestone multi-piece truck wheels that would explode under certain circumstances. And if you were around it, you were toast. You were broken up in pieces. And we had a products liability case against Firestone for just that. We tried the case against Firestone. Firestone came out with 11 people, including lawyers and paralegals and secretaries and just little old us. And uh, the case ended nicely. Fantastic. I, I can't figure a much uh, better accolade than an adverse party giving you a, a, you know, a statement like that on the record. Well, I do want to hear the stories. And we've, we've heard one I small I can one, just but... elaborate on that. Oh, yeah. I was. Uh, sitting in my chambers one day and and the clerk came in and said there are these lawyers that are doing judge como's case he was involved in it <laughs> and um there were a bunch of these guys with very nice blue suits on and they and they were having some fight about something but judge como wasn't there and they wanted to see a judge and these guys came in and blah 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 blah, blah and they were all upset with mr kruger Mm -hmm. And Jim, I always thought I should have sanctioned him, but he said, 
Your Honor, I'm not going to listen to these supercilious SOBs from the mainland. <laughs> this was not on the record, though. But uh, yeah, he's, uh, Kruger has quite a reputation for being uh, aggressive. And, uh, and that's a good trait, but there are other good traits as well. Well, let me, let me speak to that. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in law school, we, our first year in corporations, the very first class, the professor defined a corporation as a body without a heart. We deal with insurance companies. They epitomize that. And in a small community, <clears throat> when people need help, they go to you because they know you're going to go to the mat for them. You don't, they don't go to you because you're nice or that you're popular. They know that you will try to your best within ethical and legal parameters to prevail. And <clears throat> that sort of leads me into something that's a pet peeve. But, you know, we talk about lawyer civility. Mm -hmm. The court is the last place in this time where two people can go in and fight within appropriate standards. Yeah. And if you are not ready to do that, and you're not ready to put the other guy down legally, or woman, mm -hmm. then you're not doing your job because they can get up and hurt you, and hurt your client is who it is. My job is to my client, not to you as opposing counsel. I'll treat you with respect, but I don't have to be nice. Civil, I don't know what that means. We're all civil. But um, it's important to keep in mind who we owe our obligations to. Okay. Okay. Well, I, I, I hear you on that, and I, and, I, and I don't disagree with that. I mean, as a former president of the bar, I have to say that, that you know, civility within the bar takes on a different meaning when it talks about the way, it's not the message, it's not how, how aggressive you may be, but how you portray yourself in our profession you know, makes a difference. And we can articulate things without, for example, having to use profanity or having to call somebody names or do other things that aren't necessarily in our client's best interest. But I don't want to get too far off, off and astray. You started on that one. I do want to hear your story. I just want to say in response to that that it's always been my view that the criminal bar is more civil than the civil bar. But <laughs> is it, now, why do you think that? Uh, probably because you're always uh, dealing with the government. You're fighting the government, uh, either state or federal, and, and generally they, they, they tend everybody to. Everybody has to behave and be honorable. I, I, I would, you know, I've presided over civil and criminal trials, lots yes. of them, and I think Phil's right. You know, criminal <coughs> is a high degree of volume, and uh, people's people's lives are are at stake. And I think the lawyers have a lot more trials to do. So yeah. they, they learn fairly quickly that they've got to be thorough but civil. I don't think there's anything wrong with being civil. Do you think that, that being in a, in a location like on Maui with a limited number of attorneys, with a smaller populace, with, you know, where you're going to see the same attorneys, you're going to see the same judges in this over and over, has a, the effect of creating a, a sort of a, a, uh, an atmosphere of civility more so than if it were in a larger place, if you lived in L.A. or if you were practicing it in, in you know, a much larger community? I think so, yes. I, I don't. Think, uh, okay. Here's my view on that. Uh, my practice uh, was for many years mostly off of Maui and uh, all over the United States and in other countries. And I always felt that living on Maui, in a gulch, in a lovely place, was such a special uh, privilege that I needed to bring that with me wherever I went mm -hmm. as a lawyer. And it wasn't so much civility to other lawyers, it was as someone coming from Maui in Hawaii and getting to bring a little tiny piece of that into the judicial system in other places. One thing about a small community like Maui, I, I, I think whether it's cr criminal or civil, but is people get to know the judges very well. Yeah. And so uh, in the criminal area, uh, I've got two young criminal lawyers next door to me, and they often will ask me, how much, what would you sentence this guy to? And, uh, you know, they, 
we have three different judges there. Yeah. And uh, the first question is, well, which one are you before? You know, <laughs> and, and everybody gets to know who they are and what their inclinations uh, and weaknesses might be. Mm -hmm. But Jim, you, you said no. You didn't uh, I disagree with that from my standpoint because, first of all, there are no defense lawyers on Maui. So all the lawyers I deal with are in Honolulu. Uh, secondly, we represent maybe a third of our practice, our mainland people that come out and get injured in Hawaii. Mm. So we do a lot of federal work and we do a lot of stuff on the mainland. Mm. Uh, I'm probably off island three months a year in combined Sorry. pieces of litigation, depositions, experts, etc., on the mainland. Um, so we never see anybody up on, town, uh, on Maui, uh, you know, professionally. I see. But let me make one thing clear. Um, I never start a fight with another lawyer. Mm -hmm. And I don't have too many fights with lawyers. The distinction that we have, the ingredient that these guys don't, is there's another entity that determines how the ca each case that I'm involved in will mm -hmm. play. And that's the liability insurance that's carrier. True. If they have a reasonable attitude, which we found when we first started to practice in the 60s and 70s, insurance companies were a lot more reasonable then. But that's because the claims were being resolved in Hawaii. What's happened in the last 10 years is that the majority of the companies have either closed shops here or the major decisions are being made on the mainland. And they don't care. People in the mainland don't care what goes on out here. So we're dealing with issues, not people that are antagonistic to the rights of our clients. Sure. Well, I, I think Jim has a point that he's correct about. That is, it comes down to the money. And the insurance industry has centralized this decision making. I mean, I've been in settlement conferences where we're waiting for an answer from some adjuster in Chicago or New York who's at Clark Hatch doing her exercises. You know, and we've got a four or five attorneys a very high rate spinning their wheels because we can't get an answer. Wow. And so I, I think um, the failure to make decisions locally is, is a problem today in the civil area. How about just from your standpoint, you look back on a career practicing law, having all these cases, you know, having dealt with them as a judge, you know, having tried them both on a criminal side, in particular as a plaintiff's attorney, a, a number of reported decisions run the pages for you. Tell me something about one that, that sticks out to you that you, you remember that, you know, if you were picking one saying this is, this is something where I made a mark or I did something important or, or means a lot to me. Me? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, John. Uh, I, I don't know that I made a mark, but I did uh, probably the longest civil trial uh, tried to a jury back in 1990, which was uh, had to do with the sewer pipe in Kihei. And um, it's a long story that I don't think we have time to hear at all, but uh, we had a Phoenix law firm with about four partners down. They rented the old Kahului Railroad building. They brought their whole staff. They represented United Technologies, and Wally Fujiyama was in the case representing Amico, and uh, the plaintiffs were represented by uh, professional pipe sewers from California, um, and that was, uh, a, I don't think the result was the right result, but we did it, and mm -hmm. the process worked, and uh, I'm, I'm proud of my performance in it. I did the best I could, Go which ahead. is all you can do. It's, uh, but we had but literally about five months of testimony. Oh, is that right? Wow. All right, I'm going to come back to lead off with you, Phil, and, and, and your story, the one that you remember the most there. We're going to take another break. You're watching uh, The Living Legend Lawyer, Hawaii State Bar Association's forum, brought to you by Think Tech Hawaii. We'll be right back. Ted Ralston, folks, host of our show at Think Tech Hawaii called Where the Road Leads, where we talk about technology influencing the future of Hawaii. Technology, of course, is the art of solving problems. We always bring in interesting and 
inform guests who can see from different perspectives and different points of view how that future might unfold and how technology can assist us in getting there. So once again, join us 4 o'clock to 5 o'clock on Fridays. Uh, Ted Ralston, your host. And please, if you have ideas that you'd like us to address on this show or folks who you think should be on it, let us know. Aloha, my name is Josh Green. I'm a senator from the Big Island. I work in the ER there. But on Tuesday afternoons, I get to come and spend 45 minutes to an hour with Jay Fidel and the Think Tech staff. They're terrific professionals. They help us to bring some of the leading cutting edge topics here across our state to you. So you can join us at our show on healthcare in Hawaii to talk with leaders from across all the spectrum of health in our state. Or you can join us for any other show where we talk about economic development or tourism or some really eclectic programs too. So really, we'd love to see you here on our show. Thanks for joining us, and thanks for supporting us. Well, welcome back. You're watching Living Legend Lawyers, brought to you by the Hawaii State Bar Association and Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Craig Wagno, but I'm sitting here with three of our living legends. And where I left off last was talking to, to Phil, and you had a case, let's call it the Japanese Yakuza case. I'm, I'm interested to hear about that. It was, uh, I've, I, first let me say I've had actually thousands of cases and hundreds of trials and uh, they've all been important to me, but that was particularly interesting. It was a federal uh, racketeering conspiracy international criminal case uh, deluxe. Uh, and uh, I got to represent one of the heads of the Japanese Yakuza who was charged here in Hawaii by the feds with racketeering and all, the, and all those charges. There were others, it was, the defense team was Judy Pavey and Peter Wolf, Ben Cassidy and Bill Lee Harrison. And um, one of the most interesting things in the defense for, for my part was that uh, it was a conspiracy case. So everything was about an agreement to the conspiracy and all the interpretations, because everything happened in Japanese Every time anyone said hi, it would go down as yes. And it was interpreted as yes, I agree. And then, then we had an expert come in to testify that when you say hi in Japanese, you may not be meaning yes, I agree, which you have to agree in a conspiracy. And therefore, it might not have been an agreement. And indeed, uh, there was other testimony that wasn't. My client was acquitted afterwards in order to uh, make face, I suppose. I was invited to uh, Japan as his guest, and I have a memorable photo that you I gave do. you. And I, I think we, we have it up right here. I'm going to assume you're the one sitting in the middle. Well, yeah, I always, uh, <laughs> I always call this picture, what's wrong with this picture? <laughs> <laughs> it's the well, guy gen with the beard. Yeah. There you go. Oh, that's, that was fantastic. That looks like a lot of fun. Well, it was uh, stressful, but very interesting. And going to Japan, uh, it was not as relaxing as it looks. <laughs> Fair enough. I was the only one that wasn't covered in tattoos and had all my fingers. I had all your fingers. Oh, boy. Okay. <laughs> Jim, I don't know how you can pick one out from all of these, but tell us some of uh, I can't. Uh, one of the things that we've strived to do is when the law hasn't kept pace with the times, we're not afraid to take appeals. Happily, most of the time, unless it's a constitutional issue, the other side has appealed because we've prevailed. But when a large percentage of our clients are seriously injured, they're paralyzed, or the family has suffered a death, any amount of compensation that's of a significant nature is important. It's more important to them than it is to us, which is why it's so important to us to help people. I'm still practicing because I enjoy it and because we're helping people. Uh, but we had the first bad faith case, for instance. It uh, uh, wasn't later reported. Uh, uh, it was a jury verdict. Mm -hmm. And the law caught up with us like 20 years later. Uh, it's nice to make law. It's nice to get recoveries that are dignified and appropriate. Uh, I can't tell you that one quadriplegic is more standout in my cases uh, than another one. It would be inappropriate. Mm. But we do have the opportunity to keep going and do it. We were told uh, two years ago that my partner, Cynthia Wong, and I, we tried more civil cases, uh, tort cases, to verdict in the state in one year than anybody else just sitting up in the mm. valley. 
I think we had four federal court cases and three state court cases. Um, so they're all important. Yeah. Okay. Well, that, that's fair. I, 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 one of the values, perhaps, of this program and this opportunity is, is yes, to record some of your recollections of, of what it was like early on and what your career span, some of the interesting things, but it's also to help give a message to those people entering the profession now that are looking at perhaps a different landscape, um, whether it's here or on Maui or anywhere, but particularly for those that might be contemplating practicing law on Maui and such, what advice, what, what, what nugget would you give to them given your experience, your time practicing that, John? Yeah, I, when I got hired by uh, Paget Greeley, I remember uh, Wendell Marmota called me and said, meet me in the bar downstairs in your building, and he was there to you know, buy me a drink, tell me they were going to hire me. <clears throat> and he said, you know, the measure of your worth is what you bill. And I disagreed with that then, and I still do. And I think with so many young lawyers, you know, that has become such a driving problem, the, how they spend the time, how much, how much money can we make? And if you go back a, even a generation, I think lawyers were thought of more, or at least that's why I wanted to be a lawyer, as, as people that would help solve the problems uh, that, that the community has. And today, th those are very severe. You know, you've got, they're just climate change, homeless people. Mm. Um, the list goes on and on, the violence we have today in Baltimore. I mean, lawyers have a role to play. The legislature used to be mostly lawyers. I thought that was a good thing. Uh, not anymore. But, uh, you know, for the young lawyer, I'd say, you know, try to be something more uh, to satisfy yourself as, as, the, as, the, as the, that you're doing the right thing, mm -hmm. that you're helping other people. And if you have that in mind, you'll, at the end of the day, be more, more happy than you would be if you're just worried about how much you build. Phil, how about you? I want to underscore what John said. I think, especially in a small community, it's very important that a lawyer keep your eye on being a healer uh, to people's problems. They come in, everyone's got a terrible problem or they don't have to visit a lawyer, especially a criminal lawyer, but any, any, any lawyer, you got a real problem. Lawyers should always keep in mind your job is to make things better, not uh, exacerbate the problems that the people have. And so be a healer and don't lose your sense of humanity by getting too lost in the law. Jim? My area of the law <clears throat> is undergoing a tremendous change, and it's not for the good. By, because of ADR, mediation and arbitration, probably 70% of our cases now are being resolved at that level. How else can we make a living? Well, you can come practice with me. <laughs> uh, we're raising a whole generation of non-litigators. The little cases that we cut our teeth on are being ADR'd. I can't hire a young lawyer and send him out to try a quad case. He has no skills. So somehow we've got to get he or she skilled. Otherwise, we're going to another generation and we're not going to have anybody that knows how to go to court. We have a lot of people who go to court today and shouldn't. Mm. Um, by the same token, if we don't solve that problem, the things that John and Phil want to see done won't happen because we won't be able to make things happen to right wrongs and and that's a real problem so when we interview people it's interesting it's not I, I never hear what kind of experience am I going to get mm -hmm. <clears throat> they want to know how much beach time when the, ex, uh, the vacations are I would tell any young lawyer no matter what they're doing you want to be a good lawyer learn your craft don't start out on your own. Go with a good firm. Get education for three, four, five years if you want to become independent after that. 
at least you know what you're doing and you're not going to be committing malpractice along the way without even knowing it. But learn your craft. I would add to that. that that's a good point. And we need young lawyers who can, can uh, take these problems on. I mean, I think most, most practicing attorneys would agree with me. If you've got a claim that's, say, 100000 or less, there's no way you can go to court with it because the legal fees are too high. Mm. Uh, you know, they, they just don't try those cases, but somebody needs to, and we're not trying them now. And so people like me try to settle them, or they This they is on the civil side. On the Anything, civil side, yes. yes. Civil <coughs> so in order to get trial experience, you're either going to have to be dealing with money well above that, in which case it would be extremely hard to send in someone that's just cutting Correct. their teeth, or you've got to be on the, on the criminal side. We've had a lot of people come in with us for a while and then go out and leave, and we feel they've all left for the better. Sure. Even on the federal criminal side, it's very difficult to get to trial because the uh, federal sentencing guidelines give huge disincentives to people to go to trial. They're punished if they go to trial and lose way more than if they settled. So state court is really the only place in, you're likely to get much trial experience even in the criminal, and I'll put in a plug for my two sons who are working in my office. They're getting great training. Ben <laughs> and Jake are doing terrific, and they're going to be brilliant lawyers, far better than any of us. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, given this, would you recommend, we just have a little bit of time left, but I'm interested in your few comments. You've got an attorney that's looking at coming to practice law on Maui. Would you recommend coming, going to law, and in particular going to law on Maui? I don't think it makes any difference whether it's on Maui. Good law is the same wherever it's practiced, whether it's Tallahassee, Washington, Chicago, Los Angeles, or here. Okay. Same rules, same evidence, same requirements. It's up to you to set up your determinations of how you want to be in the world. If you want to be good, it's like Jimmy Valvano before he died. Never, never quit. And if you don't have that mentality, don't get into the type of thing that I do. Yeah. I've always told young lawyers, there's always room for excellence. And uh, Maui's a nice place to live. Today it's easier than ever because um, well, with federal filing electronically and the courts going to electronic filing, you could be at Ball and Beach and file a brief. True, but the, real, the <laughs> rules become more and more Byzantine, it seems to me. <laughs> but uh, that's right. The only advantage to a place like Maui is it's still relatively speaking, uh, smaller than uh, Honolulu, for example. Um, so knowing the people is better than not knowing them. Uh, well, it's wonderful. You try yeah. a case two years later, you're walking down the mall, and someone comes up, hey, Mr. Kruger, how are you doing? Now, you may not remember them. Oh, I was on your jury in the so-and-so case. Oh, well, yes, thank you. And then there's an aloha. And, I've uh, had that experience. It's yeah. a real wonderful experience. You, you don't have that in Los Angeles. There's an anonymity there that we don't have. I would expect that. Does that happen in the criminal side as well? No, they're well. in jail. <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> they uh, get out. <laughs> most of the criminal side are not terrible, violent predators. Yeah. And uh, it's important to remember that. Most people who get it in the criminal court are not terrible, scary, awful, bad people. And uh, so you're sure you run into people. It's a small community. Yeah. And especially when you've been there forever, you know everybody. Well, I want to take this opportunity to thank each of you, uh, to thank uh, John McConnell, Phil Lothal, and of course, uh, uh, Jim Kruger. It's been great to have each of you here to talk a little bit about Maui law practice. This is part of the Hawaii State Bar Association's 3D project. And uh, it's been brought to us by Think Tech Hawaii. And uh, there will be more programs to come. But uh, this has been a great opportunity to speak with some of the legends of our profession. We look forward to the next one. Thank you.